Hello, I hope your school year is off to a great start. I'm Jennifer Coldiron, the School Outreach Coordinator for Ozark Guidance. Ozark Guidance is the premier behavioral health organization serving Northwest Arkansas since 1970. That's right, we'll be celebrating our 50th anniversary this spring. And we're super grateful to the Springdale Public School System for helping us establish the first school-based mental health service uh, in Northwest Arkansas in the region in 1998. So that began at Jones Elementary School and as you all know has now spread to each one of your schools as well as all the public schools around Northwest Arkansas. So you have um, mental health professionals as part of your team helping serve families in their own school, uh, schools and neighborhoods. And we're super grateful to partner additionally with Springdale Public Schools this year for the second year in a row on a social and emotional learning series that focuses on the preventative, proactive side of mental health. So I've been asked today to recap what we covered last year in about a 15 to 20 minute video um, and also talk about what goals we have uh, to continue or look forward to this year. So I'll start that now. Social and emotional learning is the process through which children and adults acquire and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, set and achieve positive goals, feel and show empathy for others, establish and maintain positive relationships, and make responsible decisions. Arkansas became uh, one of 18 states this past summer to establish K through 12 social and emotional competencies um, or learning standards. They use an acronym Guide for Life to talk about areas uh, including growth, understanding, interaction, decisions, and empathy that will help any student reach personal success. And you can find more about the Guide for Life on Arkansas's uh, education website. SEL can be um, so many things in a school, right? It's part of the Positive Behavior Interventions and Supports uh, program. It's curriculum based, such as with Choose Love. It's non-curricular based with um, programs like Conscious Discipline, um, as well as its individual efforts that are happening in each one of your schools as part of the whole child movement. In addition, social and emotional learning when coupled with suicide prevention programs like those we offer secondary schools at no cost um, becomes a suicide prevention program. So these are some of the protective factors that social and emotional learning boosts in students um, which are also suicide uh, prevention factors including problem solving, stress coping, conflict resolution skills, communication skills, assertiveness, supportive relationships, peer connections, and school connectedness. So again, SEL can mean so many different things in a school and is certainly part of that whole child approach to education that is a result of uh, key leaders in public health as well as uh, academics coming together to recognize that students' physical and emotional health is absolutely integral to educational success. And I think we all believe that SEL is one great way to focus on the well-being of us adults as well. Because to teach SEL, you have to learn SEL. You have to focus on your own self-talk and assess, is this a negative thought that's resulting in some negative feelings that are getting me stuck, focused on the negative? And how can I let those go so I can adopt more positive thoughts that'll lend to more positive feelings and productive behaviors? It's taking a look at our self-care habits, our communication skills, and constantly striving to improve. We've put together this series, um, and last year these are the four topic areas that we covered to really be a stepping stone into this movement for some of you, and for others of you to um, act as a refresher, because you've been doing this for years, and it's time that we all came together and created a shared SEL vision. So I'll briefly highlight each of the four parts of our professional development series from last year, including some of those key classroom takeaways. So let's hit those highlights, starting with part one, brain and behavior. In this series, we focused on how Dan Siegel took Dr. McLean's triune brain model and simplified it into a tool that adults and children can use to focus on self-management. We teach students using our handy dandy hand model of the brain, 
that big emotions lie right here in their emotion brain or their limbic system. And when they get excited or angry or frustrated and those emotions start to come out in their behaviors, their lids flipped. And the first step they need to take is to, to put their lid back on, is to take a deep breath and let their human brain hug those big emotions so they can think again about how to make good decisions. And with older students and adults, we talk about lid flipping as well, but we go more in depth and we share what are those 11 executive skills that go offline when we have um, something challenging that flips our lid or when we feel maybe unconsciously um, threatened. And those skills include attention, our ability to stay focused, um, our ability to show empathy towards other people and be flexible. Impulse control is often also what immediately goes offline. And while we adults always um, are reminded frequently that students are not fully developed in their brain, we too have to remember that even though us 25 year olds and higher have a fully developed brain, we can flip our lid constantly as well. So the handy dandy hand model is a great signal that you can use uh, in between colleagues or you can teach young students to non-verbally show you they need a break or you can show them to take a deep breath with this handy, handy, handy dandy hand model. And if um, those words weren't enough, we reviewed lots of resources to teach students about the triune brain model, including the Choose Love curriculum, uh, where they talk about how to leave the lizard, to nudge the numbat, to hug the human um, as their way of explaining the three parts of the brain. And those, of course, are at no cost and downloadable on the Jesse Lewis Choose Love Movement website. And there were others that we discussed, too. So you can email me if you want more ideas about how to teach students uh, the brain as a foundation for understanding self-control and self-regulation in the classroom. In part two, we covered trauma-sensitive classrooms and learned that students in Arkansas might be more likely to have their lids flipped than any other state in the nation. Per parent reports, Arkansas ranks 50th or worst in the nation for the number of adverse childhood experiences on average um, for, our, for our children. In other words, 30% of our children have experienced at least two adverse childhood experiences. We know from Dr. Nadine Burke Harris's research that the odds of having a learning or behavioral problem in school are 32 times higher for children who have experienced four or more ACEs than those who have experienced none. What this evidence teaches us is that misbehavior is often a disruption in the neurological development of a child. In other words, their connection between their upstairs brain and their downstairs brain might not be very strong. They're not only fully developed in their upstairs brain, but they have weak connections. So they might have weak emotional uh, control and that might come across as aggression. Or in other cases, uh, they have a hard time with goal achievement and task initi initiation. Um, so out of fear of looking stupid, they might not participate, hide in their hoodie, or uh, avoid class. This requires us to really look at changing our school culture and recognizing that we for a long time have prioritized teaching and expected students to come in like cool, calm, collected pots of water ready to learn. When the reality is we have a lot of students walking through our doors who are already at a rolling boil and just a little confrontation um, or an academic challenge can be enough to set them boiling over. And we've got to figure out how to readjust our priorities so that our number one focus is safety. And our number two focus is connection and caring relationships with students so that they feel safe enough and willing enough to learn. One resource we went over uh, for how to go about this culture shift is the flexible framework. This is free and downloadable from traumasensitiveclassrooms.org. Emphasis is placed on relationships as one of the most effective ways for teachers to help. And they also talk a lot about predictability and practice of roles and how to 
um, properly behave again and again and again and again because we know that uh, neurons that fire together wire together they say so it takes many 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 times sometimes up to 2,000 times for a new skill to be learned and what does that mean in the classroom we went over three examples um, and perhaps this would be a good place to start again for some inspiration this year of real teachers applying those types of uh, suggestions, relationships, predictability, practice of uh, roles and rules in the classroom. So I'd encourage you to check out uh, any or all of these videos for real teachers ideas on how to create such environments. An additional tip we talked about was making a shift from classroom rules to classroom commitments. Um, and perhaps you already started this year this way, or if you didn't, it's not too late to go back and circle up the class and say, hey class, what do we want our classroom to look like, sound like, and feel like? And from that conversation, co-create a list of positive behavior statements that you review every single day. And that's the difference between classroom rules and classroom commitments. You review a commitment list every day. And maybe you have some movement and some fun with how you review that list and tangibles would be the best idea to where a student physically takes a clothespin or their name or their representation in a, a plastic uh, dinosaur, who knows, and says, this is me and I'm focusing today on physical space. I'm gonna keep my hands to myself uh, or use gentle touches for a young kid, for example. And at the end of the day, you review. Were you able to keep your commitment? Yay, you did it. Or no, you weren't. And so, oops, you get to try again tomorrow because we know it might take you 2,000 times of practicing uh, keeping your body safe. And we're going to give you the opportunity to focus on that again. But these visuals help a student focus their attention. And it's important for secondary students as well to go over daily classroom commitments. Will it sound different? Of course. And perhaps it's a student's job uh, to review what the commitments are. Um, or to bring a grounding positive thought uh, to the beginning of a class or to lead a mindful minute. Uh, but that idea of predictability lends to safety is important. So those routines and those rituals that start your classrooms off on the right foot, so to speak, um, are a great way to start creating a trauma-sensitive classroom. Another way to create connections between students are brain breaks. And as many of you know, um, brain breaks take time, but they save you time uh, in that they let students get out some energy, get out some wiggles, and more, more importantly, create connections between one another. And that connection uh, lends often to cooperation and more time on task as a result. So rock, paper, scissors is a great brain break that uh, we found students in secondary schools uh, love just as much as the little kids and they will even turn it into other characters that might relate to characters in a book or atoms in a science class, um, but different kinds of variations to the old game, rock, paper, scissors, are a great way to break up the class, form a competition. Each day there can be a new champion in the rock, paper, scissor challenge. So it's one that um, you can use multiple days and weeks uh, in a row. And of course, there's lots of other places to find brain breaks. We like the Zensational supplementary package offered on the Choose Love website that's got some mindfulness lessons and activities. So you might check that out, out as well. And then in part three, uh, we reviewed verbal de escalation skills because we know school is not all fun and games. So for this, we chose uh, Conscious Disciplines, Seven Powers, and Seven Skills from Dr. Becky Bailey because we know many of you out there in the Springdale Public School System have been using Conscious Discipline for years. And it's one of the only social and emotional programs that's non-curricular, meaning it's not about opening up a binder. It's about teaching adults new skills. It's really focused on uh, tooling up adults who are the constant within our school buildings um, and giving them the oxygen they need, so to speak, before they put on the oxygen mask for students. Um, so with this, she talks about the seven powers of conscious adults being the foundation of change, long-term lasting change. Um, and she says that the seven powers 
are based in mindfulness research and they guide us to becoming conscious, present, attuned, and responsive in the needs of ourselves and our children. The most important thing we can do is put our own oxygen masks on first because the biggest threat to a children's sense of safety is an out of control adult. The key to safety is conscious, mindful adults. So this allows us to become conscious of our own wisdom, to remain calm in the face of antagonism and disorder. And once we've remained calm and we know um, that focusing on what we need students to do rather than what they need to stop doing is more helpful um, with the power of attention or the example of power of free will. When we recognize we cannot control students, we can only control ourselves. But we can use certain verbal skills that make it more likely that they will uh, cooperate and truly it's connection that leads to cooperation. So a controlled conscious adult who's focused on building relationships and has these skills is the most likely to create a cooperative classroom. And what are those skills? The skills of discipline are the only skills needed to transform everyday discipline issues into teachable moments, according to Dr. Bailey. Bailey. She says, the seven skills emerge from the foundation of the seven powers for conscious adults. That as we become more conscious of our reactions to conflict, we can choose a different response. The seven skills teach you to respond to conflict in a way that helps children move from those resistant, lower centers of their brain to the more cooperative, higher centers. And these include, number one, our composure, um, but also assertiveness. Again, telling kids what to start doing rather than what to stop doing, as well as skills for that emotional part of the brain, including choices, encouragement, and empathy. And skills for when a student has made a mistake, uh, but is calm enough to learn from that mistake. And those two skills are consequences and positive intent. You can review these uh, powers and skills on the Conscious Discipline website, and she's got lots of other free resources, um, including a webinar series and the great podcast, Real Talk for Real Teachers. Uh, a new episode was just recent re recently released um, where a real teacher talks about how important Conscious Discipline is for secondary schools as well and how she's going about doing that. So I encourage you to check out those resources. In part four, we covered unconscious bias. In unconscious bias, um, we learn from the research when us good, fair-minded people like you and I sometimes unconsciously act in ways that treat people based on stereotypes and not on individual merits. These biases we can slip into when we're not being very mindful include affinity bias, where we're drawn to students who remind us of ourselves or of our own children but also these four here, including recency bias, the tendency to judge people based on recent events rather than long-term records, confirmatory bias, the tendency to seek out information that confirms what we already believe, negativity bias, the idea that we recall negative experiences more frequently than positive ones, and we're often overconfident in making our decisions. So these natural tendencies are why the Kerwin Institute, a leader in this area, recommends that we institutionalize cool down periods for us adults before we issue out consequences or um, formalize that a student was subjectively disobedient. This is also um, a good reason to track data on discipline in intersectional ways. That looks at, for example, how race and ability status um, are measuring up in our suspensions or our expulsions. You can find a lot more on the Kerwin Institute website if you're interested in their free webinars. So that concludes my recap of last year's social and emotional learning series. This coming school year, our overall goal at Ozark Guidance is to assist you all to continue to shift to, from more reactive approaches to more proactive, reflective, integrated, preventative approaches to not only stu student well-being, but us uh, the well-being of us adults through different social and emotional learning programs and approaches. So specifically, I want to bring you more brain-based strategies, including more on brain breaks, more on mindfulness, verbal de-escalation skills, and emotional regulation practices uh, that are practical for the classroom. Uh, we also heard it'd be helpful to separate primary and secondary examples, so we'll try to do that moving forward. 
and that recorded links would be more helpful than live streams so that you can tune in when it's best for your school. So check, check, and check. We'll bring those changes this year. If you all would do me a favor and please make any other suggestions you have or um, just tell us a need that you're not sure how to meet but you would like it to be addressed in our uh, Put those in our inbox, schooloutreach at ozarkguidance.org, and I will do my best as we develop this series over the uh, next few months to meet those challenges and those needs. Thank you so much for your time this morning. Um, if you have additional time now as you're together, or perhaps some other time, I encourage you to talk about your vision for social and emotional learning. What's going well? Where do you want to see yourself in three to five years? And what's perhaps one action you can take now to promote your own well-being as well as that of students. So have a wonderful school year. I'm looking forward to partnering with you again. From all of us at Ozark Guidance, we wish you well.